you see me and hear me? Oh, there she is, yes. Okay. Oh, there she is. Okay. 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 Rabbits and Gottlieb. Yes. We just had a chalame for a lovely young but mitzvah lady. So mm -hmm. I'm going to get everybody to say hello and then I'm going to mute and I'll come back before you finish because we're here in London. Okay, Dahlia. Wow. Everybody wave your hand. My special teacher, okay, my special teacher, who we always quote, um, Rebertson Gottlieb Rebertson Heller is here online and she's doing a Zoom class to people all over the world, okay? And they've come to say mazel tov to Dahlia and then we're gonna ca carry on, but I just wanted to introduce the, the talk and mazel tov to Dahlia, mom, grandmom, all grandparents, everybody, and we should just only have wonderful things. And now we're gonna carry on and enjoy everybody and a pleasure and an honor to have Rebus and Gottlieb with us. Okay, and mazel tov, that's quite a thing to come on with a challah baking. Terrific. Okay, so we are going to be talking about Tu Bishvat, which is just around the corner. So we do have a reference to Tu Bishvat in the oral tradition. It says that there are four Rosh Hashanahs. You could think, isn't one Rosh Hashanah enough? No, they're for different things. One is the Rosh Hashanah that we're familiar with, the very beginning of the year. But there's also a Rosh Hashanah for counting kings. Like if a king begins his reign on April 31st, you'll still count it from the day that it's the Rosh Hashanah of Kings. You have Rosh Hashanah for Meiser, and you have Rosh Hashanah for the trees. So you could, what does that mean, Rosh Hashanah for trees? What is it supposed to do? It's supposed to um, eat apples with honey? What, what does a tree do on its Rosh Hashanah? So the answer is that a tree and everything else in the world that isn't human is different than a human. How so? There are two different kinds of divine providence. One is called hashkacha kvalit, general providence. The other is called hashkacha pratit, particularized providence. So what general providence means is that every single thing in the world, when you go up to the highest levels of the cosmos or down to the micro world of tiny organisms, Hashem is aware and involved continually. Aware and involved. There's no... There's no microbe Hashem isn't aware of. It can't exist for even a moment without Hashem's will. However, there's no such thing as a good microbe or a bad tiger or um, a, neur a neurotic piece of wood. So Hashem's involvement in their presence has to do in seeing that the species could continue. However, with people, it's a whole other story. Hashem's involvement is directly correspondent to the degree to which we search for him. In Ashray, we say, Karov Hashem l'chol kar'av, l'chol ashik rubemet. Hashem is close to all of those who call out to him, all of those who call out to him in truth. So for humans, there's always some degree of hashkacha pratit. Hashem's direct involvement to them as individuals. That's why people could be rewarded and punished. If Hashem was unaware of what individuals do, how could he possibly reward or punish? Now, that takes us back to our question. What do we mean when we say Rosh Hashanah for trees? The tree in your backyard, the oak in your backyard, isn't different than innumerable other oaks in the world. It's not good, it's not bad, it doesn't make choices. So why does it have a Rosh Hashanah? So there are two perspectives that we're going to talk about. One of them is Adam, ki Adam et a person is like a tree of the field. Where does it say this? It says this in the Torah when you have laws concerning warfare. It says when you surround an enemy village, okay, you can't cut down the fruit trees. Okay, now there are exceptions to this, but the rule is you can't do this. Why? Because the tree is like a person. So what do we mean when we say tree is like a person? Think about people who you know, are they like trees? Do they have bark? You know, like they have innumerable leaves now. So in what sense is a tree like a person? Its root is in the earth, just like a person. It says, a dumb may offer, a person is made of the dust of the earth. That's our bodies. But the same way a tree, all its branches, its fruit always aim towards above it. Humans have aspiration. So every person compared to a tree, 
It does convey the idea there's something physically happening to an actual tree also. The sap begins to rise from the earth and the tree begins to reassume life. On a human level, our roots are in the earth. When you were a baby, your basic definition of self was your body. A person is of the earth, our roots are there, but our aspirations take us towards meaning. So it says, don't cut down the tree. Don't do that. Why? Because the fruit of a person's labor in this world has to do with how they took that which is earthly, the roots, and let it address itself to that which is heavenly, the soul. Don't cut it down. Let it do its process. Let it perform. So Rosh Hashanah for Ilanot also has to do with actual trees as well. If you're counting how old a tree is, now you could say, who cares how old a tree is? So the answer is the halachot that relate to the age of trees. The one that's most um, significant for our purpose is orla. So what orla means is if you have a fruit tree, you don't eat of its fruit the first year or the second year or the third, then you could eat it. Three years have to pass. Okay, so what that tells you is you must know when to begin to count the years. So we begin counting from Rosh Hashanah the Ilanot. Okay, so all of this still doesn't answer our question. Why do we care about this? So the sap is going up to the tree. So a tree is like a person and a person is like a tree. Why don't you just get on with your life? Okay, that would be true whether you knew all of this or not. So the reason why this is worth knowing is it gives you a different appreciation of what it is to be human. When we do have bodily needs and bodily desires, our roots are in the earth, but anyone who's going to attain any genuine and enduring level of happiness is going to move upward as well. Not to stay in the earth, but to move forward, to move upward. So this is hinted in the laws concerning when are you allowed to take in the fruit of a tree? So the answer there in halacha is not the first year, not the second year, not the third year. The fourth year is your first opportunity to actually eat of the fruit. That means you let, the, you let a certain maturity take place in the hearts of those who are engaged with the tree. Okay, there's something happening. If you know, how old is it? When will it be permitted? So a parallel to this in our behaviors is a custom. It's only a custom, not a halacha. Not to cut a little boy's hair until he's three. He's viewed as unformed yet, unfinished. He's like the tree that didn't yet bear permitted fruit. What happens to a child when he's three? So even though, as you all know, those of you who have children, babies begin to babble words at a little over a month. They understand far more. They understand no, no, and they understand bye-bye, and they sometimes will do it on their own. Okay, but they can't have what we would call humanized speech, speech about ideas, speech about past, present, future. Talk about what reality has taught them. A child can't do this. Does that mean that they're um, somehow evil and not good and not deserving of anything? No, they're deserving of our protection. Don't cut down the tree. Okay, so I, tell, I want to move aside just for a second, but I'm going to come right back. Trust me. So that's why chinuch is so important. That's why educating your child properly is so important, even when he's little. You could say, okay, I'll send my child to a Jewish school when he's eight. Then he appreciates things, and he'll absorb much more than that. No. When he's three, he should be in a firm playgroup, if that's at all possible, because when he's, what he's going to absorb from this person who he's with is very much. A person is like a tree of the field. It absorbs everything, and it produces in the image of that which it's close to. Okay, so now we understand one thing about Tu B'Shvat. We understand what it means when we say it's a Rosh Hashanah for trees. Yes, and what that would mean is a mini Rosh Hashanah for us since we're compared to trees. So with all of this in mind, let's go further. Okay, so uh, somebody, uh, Rabbi Orlovsky sometimes says, okay, great Yom Tov. Um, the Goyim threatened, the Jews fled, 
Jews chose, and they overcame their fear. Meaning you have to choose. You have to choose to look at this tree, which is yourself and every other person, certainly children, but also yourself, move towards maturity without fear, without, without being stuck. Okay, so again, two bishva. We begin counting the years of the tree. When is it going to bear fruit? When is it going to see its potential through? So I don't know who's listening, and I certainly don't know who, how old you are, but these are questions for everyone, and the older you get, the more relevant these questions are. Okay, now, Tu B'Shvat is the 15th of the month of Shvat. We have several other 15s. What are some 15s with which you're familiar? Now, now, you know, come on, let's... The steps up to the, the, the steps. But I didn't hear you. The steps. The steps. The steps. Excellent. Very good. So here's how the Beis Hamikdash was constructed. Beis Hamikdash literally means the sanctified house, but it wasn't a house at all. It was a series of courtyards. So you have a large outer courtyard, which is where the action basically happens. The prayers, the korbanos. Then you have steps leading to an inner one and more steps leading to the holy and holies. So the more steps there are, the more distant your journey has to be in your mind and in your soul about how distant you are from what? From the nonsense that you saw as a child where you came from and how decent things are for you now, how growth oriented you are. You're making it to a Rosh Hashanah for you as well as for the tree. So it requires thought. So the set of stairs led from the men's section, the large general section, Okay, downwards to the women's section, which is again, as we said, the Azara where everything went on. So you could look at it women's to men, women to women, it's the same 15 steps. Why 15 steps? Why have that? So the number 15 is unique. It's made out of Yud and, as you know, hay. Okay, Yud is a symbol of the masculine element. It's above the line, not on the line. So what a man has to do in life is to rise as far as he can and then bring it down. Teach the Torah, give the smicha, take what you learned when you were up there studying and bring it down. It's up to down. Now, which is the more important step of the two, up or down? So from a Judaic perspective, down is more important. The only reason why Hashem would have put a soul in an earthly body is so it, could, so it could rise. And you'll only know the pace to which any person is risen at their death. So it's up for the sake of down. Okay, so that's Yud. The letter He is a symbol of femininity. Now the word He shows you two feet on the floor. It's very basic. It has a roof like Sarah's tent, like Rachel's tent, okay? Hay has opposite movement potential. It doesn't move from above to below. It moves how? From below to above. From below to above, a woman's primary service isn't bringing down Torah, although she's permitted to study Torah deeply, but her primarily, her primarily real role is what? Raising it from the bottom. So Mashiach is going to come from David, okay? David's whole service of Hashem was taking what's distant and bringing it close. Okay, so what does this have to do with Tu B'Shvat? So Tu B'Shvat is the 15th of Shvat. It's 15 is what? Yud and He. It's the 15th day. It's where the male and female elements meet. When you talk about male and female elements, if you go back, right, before we were talking about bodies, Okay, chesed and gvura. We have those as the two most primal experiences with Hashem that could be. Okay, so on Rosh Hashanah, the Tu B'Shvat, what should you be doing? Ask yourself one basic question. The basic question is, am I a hey and a yud? Am I able to stay down here and do what my family needs, do what I need, and at the same time be aspirative? and find out what the Torah says and see its beauty and, so to speak, its poetry as we have in this, in this coming week's parasha. You have to do two things at once, okay? 
So the Rosh Hashanah for Tree celebrates that it's possible to do things for once. Yes, you could have the, so let's go back to the laws of the, eight, the Ehud. So the son of the family, who must be in his early 20s, came, came once he was off for a visit with grandma and pa. That makes sense, right? After the meal, when they, was, when they, when they were standing to get, um, to get themselves fulfilled, what happens? The yud, the hay, the joining. Okay, so you have the, the Rosh Hashanah bringing fruition. The yud and the hay meet in the 15 steps. We have the yuchud between the male element and the female elephant, element. Yud and hay come together. Okay, now you've all been to Sheva Brachas. Is that true? Anybody here never was to Sheva Brachas? So you've heard the speech. I have a theory, the same way I think that there's only one big bowl of egg salad and it goes from bar mitzvah to bar mitzvah. I think that it's basically one Sheva Brachas speech but it goes from person to person. So at some point in the speech, the speaker is going to say, Razi, Shimmy, I wish you all the best. I'll tell you the secret. And everyone's, yes, what's the secret? Okay. The word for ish is aleph shin, with a yud between the aleph and the sin. The word for isha doesn't have a yud there, but it has a hey at the end. Okay, when they come together, they spell God's name. But when you take out the yuds and the additional letters, all you have is the verb esh, which means fire. So it means people sometimes aren't appreciative of Torah. They have to see its fire, its meaning in order to grow with it. It's part of their fruition. So as a woman, what does this mean? As a woman, what this means is you follow the big rule of life. So I wanna tell you now what the big rule of life is. You take yourself wherever you go, see that it's a good self you schlep along with you. That's the basic limud, the basic thing we learn from the setup of Tu Bishvat. That Hashem wants us to use, the Yud wants us to use the hey, the feminine, masculine aspects of self. He wants us to be ourselves, but he also is a wise person besides being a scholar. He's a wise person. He's a wise person he knew that if eggs ended up in the bottom of my closet for having to do with, um, with bringing things together, then you're going to be able to have this Yud and Hay come together. So Reishi and Shimi, the Seif of Brachas will conclude. Shimi, you're the Yud. Reishi, you're the Hay. Come together, spells out Hashem's name. If you take that out, all you're left with is ash fire. You can consume each other with your unfulfilled potentials. Okay, so now we know the underlying theory. We understand Rosh Hashanah Le'ilanot. We understand Adam Isha Sadeh, Eitz Sadeh. We understand the three-year growth period. We understand fruition for men comes from above to below, from women below to above. We understand the number 15. We're doing very good. Now you could ask, and what do we do with it? It's Tubishva. What do you do? So in halacha, nothing. You have no special obligations in halacha for Tubishva, except for not saying tachanan, but that's, that's, you will not find that too difficult but there are customs. So where do these customs come from and why do we take them seriously? So Rav Hirsch says, a custom is the collective soul of the Jewish people. Meaning we weren't told what to do. It comes out of us, it feels real. That's what a custom is. So there are customs for Tu Bishvat, even though there's no halacha. So I'm going to tell you what the customs are. There are two Okay, my brilliant husband found the missing link. <laughs> do, you, do you hear me and see me? Do you hear me and yes. see me? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. I'm terribly sorry about what happened. I still don't know what happened, but, um, but I'm back. So we were saying there are two practices that have to do with Tu Bishva. We spoke at all the Tyra of it. The Rosh Hashanah of the trees, the person being like a tree, 15 steps, the number 15, okay, male and female, Yud and hey, we have enough Tyra on it, but what do you do? So there are two customs. 
One is to actually pray for an esrog. So you could say, now, what am I thinking about an esrog now? So the reason is that it's got no sound at all. I'm not muted, I don't know why. Okay, I do not know why there's no sound. We can hear you, Robertson. You can hear me, okay. Yes, yes. Good. So, so an esrog is an interesting one of the four species that we use in Sukkot. Each one is parallel to a part of the body, as you know. The Aravot are the lips, right? Okay, the, the Lulav is the spine, the Hadas and the eyes. Okay, what's the esrog? The esrog is a heart. And indeed, a heart is the shape of an esrog. It's not shaped like a valentine. So this is a time to pray for a good heart, a kosher esrog. What does that mean? We spoke about yud, the male element. We spoke about hey, the female element. Up to below to above, below, below to above, above to below. They have to meet. There has to be a heart that binds them. We are asked to serve Hashem with all of our hearts. So it says, Halev maybe in the heart understands. We should want understanding to bring about all of the tikkunim of Tu Bishvat. But there's something more practical. There's a custom, not a halacha. Did I say halacha? No, I said a custom. There's a custom to eat fruits on Tu Bishvat. Okay, most people who observe this custom will have 15 different kinds of fruits parallel to the 15 songs of ascent, which were again at the steps between the male and female parts in the Beis HaMikdash, the Esos Baruch, the Nashim. Mommy, I'm using this bottle. So what does that mean? 15 fruits, or put them on the table, and this could include bread or cake that has wheat. This can include mushroom soup, which you might put use barley for. You don't have to have exotic fruits. You don't have to have dried fruits. You could use regular fruits. Okay, and with each fruit, you would say one of the 15 shir hamalot that appear in Tehillim books. Where will you find this? Tehillim 120 is the first of the shir hamalos. So you would say the bracha on the fruit or wash for bread or whatever. And then you say a shir hamalos, and you would say, I hope that this fruit, which represents something of who I am, something of the tree that I am, okay, will ascend and will join and will make things more than they were, better than they were within me for this year. The icker feeling that this is meant to evoke is gratitude. Hashem is the one who makes the sap rise. We don't have to do that. He does it for us. Hashem is the one who created the tree. We don't have to make ourselves and we don't make ourselves. It's all min hashemayim. And when you look at the lives that we lead, each of us with our roots in the ground and our aspirations above, there's what to thank for. So just by way of conclusion, it says that tzaddikim are compared to upside down trees. For them, they, they're aware of their roots being from above and they address their fruit to the world. They try to improve things for people. So Tu B'Shvat, again, to tie it all up, is the time of fruition of wanting things to be. So this is parallel. You'll notice now things that you may not have noticed before. Pesach is also on the 15th of the month. Sukkot is also on the 15th of the month. In the summer, we have the non-holiday holiday of Tu Be'av. All of them have to do with the joining of the male and female elements in the hope that we could make true peace and have true goodness in each holiday, its own specific way and dimension. So that is it for now. I hope that this, uh, my search for the missing link didn't disturb you too much. If you have questions, the time is now. Now is a good time to ask questions on any of these topics. I was told that that's fruit from the trees. Yes. But you're saying barley as well. Barley, although it doesn't grow on a tree because it's one of the seven species so for which it, yeah. Israel is praised, it could be had as well. Oh, good to know. Okay. That's, that's, what broccoli would you make on barley? 
So it depends on how it's cooked. If it's part of soup, and the main thing you're eating is soup, if you would have washed already, you would make no individual bracha. Right. If it's not, if you make, let's say, if you make, let's say, barley and raisins or whatever, you would barley say vegetables. Okay, or vegetables. So if it sticks together, if you cooked it so long that it sticks together, you would say mazonos. But if it's still individuated, you would say adama. Interesting. Okay. So you would say having a chitza uh, wheat would also be one of the shavas aminim? So you could have all of the shivas I mean, if you can get them. It's not so possible in most places to get Ramon right now. But if whatever you can of the shivas I mean, plus regular fruits. Cost now it's no problem with Ramon. Uh huh. Okay. If there's no problem anymore, I won't. Turkey make a and everything. Yeah. Okay. That's terrific. Yeah. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Any you. other questions? You're saying about fifteen. The Yom and yeah. Pesach, Pesach. And and is on the fifteenth. Yes, and sukkahs also. Uh, sukkahs as well, that's right. Yeah. Okay, and and animam is of, are, are fifteen or thirteen. How many what? Animamin. No, animamins. Are thirteen. 15. But 13. the animamins are just an arrangement that Ramba made to make us remember the Ikreyamuna. It's not from the Torah itself. It's his way of making it easy for us to remember the main ideas. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Okay, hope so. Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry for uh, the big break in the middle of the computer with the computer difficulty. Not at all. You're always worth waiting for, Rebus and Hella. <laughs> okay. Thank you thank so you. much. No, nice. thank you. Thank you. Shabbos. And good Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Thank you so much, Robertson Heller. Missed it, I think. <laughs>